There was a vision that the Lord was giving me while I was out. And he said, I shared this with you last Sunday. He said, a Joseph season is going to repeat. And in that Joseph season, there's seven years of fatness and seven years of leanness that's coming. And he said, in this season of lean, it is a season of fatness. If you're looking at seven years, some of the years is already done. Because I have been pouring my spirit over the earth in a measure unprecedented. It is the best time in your life to get intimate with God. Hallelujah, somewhere. The devil's distractions are high today. Because this is the best time to get intimate with God. And it's the season of fatness that is there. And the fatness is there because a season of leanness is coming. And if you prepare in the season of fatness, you will be ready when a season of leanness comes. There's a spiritual leanness coming. It's like what he said in Amos 8, 11 to 12. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. When I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, not of thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord, they shall wander from sea to sea and not to east, and they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. That is the kind of famine that is coming in the next season. And don't look and say, why the famine is coming? It's for us to look and say, the fatness is here and now. And you're looking and saying, I don't care when the season of leanness comes. I've drunk enough water. You know, the camel can go and drink so much of water and, and store it up in its hump. And it can go through days and weeks without water. Because of what is stored in the fatness of the hump. Things will be hard. Things will change. If you think the shaking on planet earth is finished because of no, no, COVID was nothing. Was nothing. Watch the guys on the TV that the gays and the lesbians that are saying we're coming after your children. Watch the people who are saying there's no room for God. God is a mistake. God is the idea of the bigoted. God is the idea of those who hate humanity. Look at the words that are coming out openly today. In this season, we must draw from the fatness. Hallelujah. There's somebody next to you. It's a season to draw from the fatness. Hallelujah. It's a season to draw from the fatness. And I'm looking at this morning and saying, Joseph had an anointing that came, a fatness that came, that prepared him for the lean season just now. And as I'm looking at it, I'm, I want to talk on that topic, the anointing will break the yokes. The anointing of God will break the yokes. I know we'll come up with various understandings. I felt the anointing. I saw the anointing. If there's a miracle, there's an anointing. If there's a healing, we call it anointing. We call different things. If there's a prophecy, we call it anointing. And, and yes, those things can be associated. But the anointing is not a miracle. The anointing is not Samson with the jawbone of an ass smashing up thousands of people. Those things can result around an anointing, but the anointing itself is different. And I want for us to consider that today. I want for us to look in a couple of texts and, and for us to understand what the anointing it is because we need to give an account to God for an anointing that's on our lives. The anointing in the Bible is a fatness of God, a fatness of His services, His gifts, His presence in the hearts and lives of people. Catch what I started with just now. Two simple points. I'll put it up right now for you. Two simple points. Number one, when you come under the blood, something shifts. And you come under the radical yoke-breaking anointing. When does the anointing hit? It, 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 it doesn't hit if you hit the ground when someone's praying over you. When you come under the blood, you come under God's anointing. Can you say hallelujah? hallelujah. If you're under the blood this morning, 
If you're not under the blood, get under the blood. If you're not under the blood, get under the blood. You need the blood of Jesus just now for everything in your life. Because everything is temporal. Believe whether you're a Christian or not, whether you're a pastor, whether you're a leader, whether you are, you are the bishop, whether you are the pope, everything that you have can be taken from your hand right now. But the anointing puts something that can't be taken away. The anointing puts the fatness of God in your life. Hallelujah somewhere. Hallelujah somewhere. And you will come under the radical yoke baking anointing. The fatness of the anointing breaks the yokes of human limitations with an outpouring of a fatness of God. Just two bad points this morning. Just two points this morning. Write it down. I hope you're able to memorize it already. You got my message already before you can go back. You see, when people come to God, when people move, Sometimes even people who come to God can fall, in, fall into situations and circumstances that are difficult. And I like that place where this verse comes up. It comes up in Isaiah 10, 27. It says, and in that day, the burden of the enemy, the yoke of the enemy will depart in some versions, taken away in some versions, they use the word, removed from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck and the yoke will be broken and destroyed because of the fatness or the anointing or the fatness or the oil. Can you look at those different words that the Bible uses to describe it? In some versions, they will translate it as anointing. In some versions, they will simply translate it as fatness. But catch those words. They'll translate that word in Hebrew simply means oil, simply means fatness. Simply used in the Old Testament to use the word anointing. It all comes from the same pool. And he's looking and saying, the enemy will put things to hold you in and place a yoke around your neck. And the enemy will place something on your shoulder. And you're hoping that something will come from outside and just smash and cut it. And he says, no. Nothing from outside is going to cut it. He says, God will do something with you you will develop a fatness and you will bust whatever the enemy, hallelujah, come on, come on. Whatever the enemy puts on your neck will burst because of the fatness. Somebody say hallelujah. Sometimes we saying, God break the word, the thing of the enemy off. You want it to be broken without a fatness from God. It will never happen. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me, church? You want God, you, you say, Oh God, it's all of you, you just come and do it. And God says, I will come. And I will come to you. I can strike Goliath with a heart attack. I can take his breath out this moment. I can, he can fall on a boulder and he can break his legs and the next battle he's no more ready for. But he says, I will come upon David. I will come upon David. The God of the Bible always comes upon his people. And the yoke is broken because of the fatness that God brings into the lives of his people. Somebody say, thank you, Jesus. Somebody give the Lord a clap offering. Somebody say this morning, I want the fatness. I need the fatness. What you and I need is, 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 is sometimes you're saying, God, you do the miracle because it seems like when you say miracle, you put everything into God's hand. But there's a pregnancy and fatness in faith that will bring your miracle to your side just now. And God's looking at his people and saying, hey, you know, I know you are my people. You messed it up. You get into yokes. You get into slavery. And I want you to know I'm bringing an anointing upon your life. And the yoke will be broken because of the fatness of God. You see, what the devil does, he squeezes you with the yoke. And he's saying, I'm going through a bad time. I can't pray. Pastor, I, I, I can't fast. I can't read my Bible. All the things 
that will bring the fatness to you so that you will explode and break it from the inside out are the very sources that get hit when you're in hurt, when you're in pain, when you're in fear. When you're in doubt, when the things are going wrong, when there's arguments, when there's anger, when there's hatred, when there's warfare in your family and it doesn't look like a family anymore. You get cut off. Because the devil knows if he can cut off the sources, he cuts off the anointing. And I wish I can tell you that just by tears you get anointed. Beloved, there's an anointing and God says, I want to bring the fatness to you just now. When you come under the blood, it shifts. And then, he, you know, you put that besides Micah chapter 2 verse 13. He who opens the breach goes up before them. They break through. They pass the gate going out by it. The king passes before them. The Lord at the head. God is a breacher. He will breach the walls and break the yokes. And he goes with his people. He goes with them this morning. And I want you to bring those texts together as we're worshiping the Lord this morning. We're worshiping. Worship is not finished. We're worshiping as we hear. And so as you hear the word of God, you love it. Say a shout a hallelujah. Say amen this morning. Say this morning, that one's for me. Hallelujah. Let's continue in worship this morning. Let's continue this in worship this morning. Look at the fact that those who belong to God come under an anointing. Can you say that? Those who belong to God. Amen. If you belong to God, you come under an anointing, whether you like it or not. That's what the blood does. I'm looking in scriptures and I'll give you a couple of them. When you come under the blood, he's able to look. First Chronicles chapter 16 verses 19 to 22. He's, he's, he's recounting everything at the temple dedication. And he's saying when you were fewer in number, you, there was a little account. You were sojourners. You were wanderers. And he, he allowed no one to oppress them. He rebuked the kings on their account, telling the kings, touch not my anointed. Who's Abraham? Who's Isaac? Who's Jacob? Who are these people? You know, if you look at them, these, uh, it, it was almost 40 years later that Joshua had to come and remove the idols from them. For 40 years they're walking with idols and wickedness amongst them. Uncircumcision in their hearts. Abraham messed so many things up. Isaac messed so many things up. Jacob messed so many things up. There was so much of stuff with them. But wherever they moved, God looked at the nations and said, they may not be perfect, but they are my anointed. Can you praise the Lord for that? Things may not be perfect in your life. You may be going through struggles like Abraham. You might have to give up a lot of stuff like Abraham. You might be in an Isaac moment in your life. You might be in a Jacob moment in your life where you're looking and say, it looks like my soul is sold to my dear father-in-law, and sometimes the father-in-law can be your company. And in those moments, God looks at you and God begins to declare of you, this is my anointed. Hallelujah. Who said it? God said it. To somebody next to you, God said it. Hallelujah. You're looking at them and saying again, and you can see that in, in, uh, in Acts chapter 10 verse 37, you can see that you yourselves know what happened throughout all of Judea, beginning with Galilee at the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit, with power. He was doing good. He was healing the oppressed by the devil. And God was with him. Underline those words of of what it means to be anointed even Jesus was anointed hallelujah that's why he's called Christos or Messiah and what does it mean anointed one he's the anointed one hallelujah Jesus was the anointed one and the anointed one comes to our lives to anoint us and he says God anointed Jesus of Nazareth the anointing is with the Holy Spirit, not the jawbone of the ass. Sometimes we, I told you, we'll say hey, anointing, anointing, anointing. If we can see something like that, we can see David's sword and oh God is anointing David. No, he says with the Holy Spirit and with power, those two things come together. And God was with him. That is the core of the anointing. 
Can you read that with me? What was, what was happening with Jesus? He came in the flesh. He came like you and me. And so God anoints the anointed and he's called the anointed one. And he says, when I anointed him, I gave him. You look at the Trinity together. There's Jesus standing. And he says, I put my spirit upon him and I was with him. Hallelujah. That's anointing. That's anointing. It's not the miracle. It's you can go into any season of your life and you can say, God is with me. Hallelujah this morning. God is with me. That is anointing that is over there. And then in in 1 John chapter 2 verse 20, he's talking about you and me. He's talking about that early church. He says in verse 20, but you have been anointed by the Holy One. Say, I'm anointed by the Holy One. Anointing doesn't belong to the church. Uh, Anointing is not, I will anoint you so buy my certificate and put it up in your house and that I anointed you at such a place with such an oil, etc. No, 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 no. Man does not anoint, God anoints us. God anoints us and we confirm the anointing that is upon your life. Hallelujah. We confirm and affirm it. Again in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 19 to 20, he says, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaim to you, Let me jump down. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. It is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and put a seal upon us and given us his spirit. What has God done? God has anointed. The anointing is a sealing with what? For the Holy Spirit. The same thing that he done with Jesus. He changes the spirit man inside of you. Can you say that? The spirit man inside of me is changed. I can't live by the human spirit. I've got to live by the spirit of Almighty God. God puts His Spirit in my heart, in my life, inside me to begin to do different things. And you can see that again in 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, 27. He says, But the anointing that you received from Him remains in you. Can you say the anointing remains in me? Come on, I, I don't know, I don't know. I especially want somebody who's going through hard trouble. I especially want somebody who's going through hardship. I especially want someone who's crying. Especially when someone is going through a difficult patch in their life. I want you, when you are, you know, you're in the worst moments of your life. And you're able to look at God and stand. And everyone looks at you in your worst moment and says, your ten kids are dead. And he says, I know my Redeemer. He lives. You see, that's anointing. You see, that's anointing. When you know that you know, that you know, that in your darkest and worst moments of your life, the anointing is remaining upon your life. When you don't see the anointing, you get negative. And you, and you can walk up to your husband and say, curse God and die. You will come out with words for yourself, I am depressed, I am this, I have this problem, I have that psychological problem, I have that emotional problem. And you will call yourself names that do not correspond with an anointing that's on your life. Are you hearing me this morning? What's the name you're calling yourself just now? Do you look every morning at your face in the mirror and say, the anointing remains on me today? Oh, we messed up. We've been in the wilderness. We disobeyed God. And yet God is looking and saying, the anointing remains. Samson messed it so many times, but the anointing remained. Saul messed it. But the anointing remained, beckoning and urging him, come back, come back, come back, come back to the right place. And he says, you must understand the anointing that you receive from him abides in you. The anointing abides in you. Let me go quickly. Psalms chapter 2 verses 1 to 6. He says, why do the nation rage? Why do the people plot vain things? Anti-conversion, this thing, that thing. Wipe out the Christians. The latest leak from some of the extremist posts have been. Be intolerant with the Christians. We'll take Nagaland and Mizoram and and Megalia next. And we're going to do this and we're going to do this. Hey! 
he who sits in the heaven laughs at you because you're coming against the anointed. They may be in the forest, but they're anointed. They may have lost children, but they're anointed. They may have lost buildings, but they're anointed. The anointing will remain upon them irrespective of where you chase them. And they will come back because the God that is with them is a God that will make sure the anointing comes back in full. Come on, give him the glory this morning. Of a money pool, say, the anointing remains. The anointing remains of a money pool. It could not be removed from Kandamal. It could not be removed from all. It could not be stopped when we had any conversion bills in Karnataka. It will never be stopped by any government. Because he who sits in the heaven laughs. And look at what he says. Why do you take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed? Oh, I can quickly run through another verse. First Samuel 26, 7 to 11. David has, has Saul in the place. And, he's, and, and all the rest of his guys say, Your enemy is in your hand. Now kill him. Kill him. You got Saul. Look at the next verse. The next slide, please. And David's looking and saying, David's looking and saying, He said, He's not in my hands. I can't use my hands. Saul is in the hand of God. I cannot touch God's anointed. David, you just receive an anointing from Samuel that you're the next king. He says, I don't care what I am. I'm not touching Saul. You can't touch the anointed and be guiltless. Are you catching it this morning? He says, the Lord forbid that, if the Lord wants, the Lord will strike Saul. The Lord forbid that I should put my hand against the Lord's anointed because the calling and the gifting are irrevocable in people's lives. He was still going to be king. Saul was still going to be king. Samson was still going to be the judge. He was going to mess the anointed. They were both going to trample the anointed. And I always look and tell people, we don't go around championing the fall of the anointed. That is God's business. Be careful of the devilish people who call themselves Christians and spend their time on websites doing post-mortem on the fallen anointed. Their whole life is dedicated to analyzing Bethel, analyzing Hillsong, trying to find out where the church is human, beloved. I have my weaknesses too. I have my weaknesses too. But don't touch the anointed. We live in a day and age where people are very free. We'll sue the pastor. We'll sue this. We'll sue the church. We'll sue that. Because people have forgotten that the brother and sister of Moses spoke, just spoke ill against him. And she was outside the camp with leprosy. Because God said, it's none of your business to deal with my anointed. I'll deal with him. When it was time, he said, Moses, son, no promised land, come up. I'll deal with Moses. And David says, God will deal with Saul. In my eyes, he's not my enemy. He's anointed. You see, the anointing never gets away from us. We need to look at this. And, and he says, forbid it. And, and, and beloved ones, you can look at that beautiful text again in 1 John chapter 2, 18 to 20. Children, it's the last hour. We have heard that the Antichrist is coming. You know, and he, and he says, so many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that this is the last hour. So where are these Antichrists? Tell us, God. They went from among us. They, but they were not of us. For if it had been so, they would have continued with us. But they went from amongst the church. Any Christ people and demon possessed people will also find a way into the church. Be careful. He says the difference between them and you is this. But you have been anointed by the Holy one. 
Be careful. Don't say I'm not anointed and be in the church because if you're in the church and you're not anointed, you belong to the wrong party and you'll fall away. You belong to the wrong place. I never wrote the Bible, please. But it's there in your Bible. They were with us. They were amongst us. They went from us. But the difference between them and you is you are anointed. Come on, that's what I tell the children. That's what I tell the kids. You can be in the same classroom, but you're anointed. You can be in the same workplace, but you're anointed. You can be in the same place where there's 25 apartments or 100 apartments, but you're anointed. Your family is anointed. Your family is different. Can somebody say hallelujah? If the anointing is not the difference between you and me and the person next door, we have nothing. We have nothing. Because the anointing breaks you out of human limitations. And you're different. The anointing comes from God. It stays, it remains. To use it or abuse it, but you will give full account for it, is the nature of the anointing. We can fool some people, we can fool a lots of people. But what's the use of not being able to try to pull the wool over the one person who is judge? And he looks at me and says, I know your heart. I know your heart. Even the prophets are running with the oil to the tallest and the fairest guy in Jesse's household. And he says, I don't look like you look, Samuel. Samuel, I don't look like you look. I look upon their hearts. I look upon their hearts. We stand naked before God. We stand naked. Nothing around us. No job, no degrees, no name, no fame. When you stand before God, you and I will give account for the anointing. You are anointed. Say that just now. God says, I'm anointed. God says, I'm anointed. Come on, just shout. Can I hear a shout? I am anointed. Come on, it sounds like 30% of us believe it. Can you shout, I am anointed. I am anointed. Stand up and say this morning, I am anointed. Hallelujah, give him a clap offering this morning. It is God that has decided that you are not ordinary. You are anointed and therefore you are different. Therefore, you are different. I tell the children, don't copy the guy, the girls in the classroom and the guys in the classroom and in the youth place. And I tell you today, don't copy the guy who's the manager. Copy the God that sits on the throne because he's looking for Jesus in you. Hallelujah, this morning you may be seated in His presence as we go on, as we go forward. Church goers living outside a radical anointing are in the category of disciples of an antichrist. Are we under the blood? Then we are anointed. The anointing radically breaks the yokes of sin and makes you children of God. It relocates you. It changes you. It makes you special. And He looks at you and, and that God of the Bible is able to look at you and say you're the apple of my eye you see we preach the christian gospel very differently we preach the christian gospel of sinners 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 and it's true that the bible says while we were yet sinners christ died for us Amen. hallelujah but i but i'm looking at the bible because there was a group of sinners Going into captivity, they sinned, they messed everything about God. They were going into captivity. God looks at them and said, you played the prostitute. But when God is talking about them, He's looking at them saying, you are the apple 
of my eye. You acted like a prostitute to me. But when I look at you, you still are the apple of my eye. And the prostitute is paying for her sin and she's going into captivity and God looks at her and, and, I, and, I, and I want for us to be able to rewrite that verse that God was not just dying for a rotten bunch of sinners. He came to the cross for the apple of his eye. He was not going to give you up. He was not going to give you up. Whatever your state, whatever your condition, whatever you became, he still saw what he made you to be. He still remembered how he created you. That God, whatever you look at yourself, however low you look at yourself, however confused you look at yourself, the God of the Bible looks at you and says, you are the apple of my eye. And that's why he died for me. The apple of his eye was lost in sin, reveling in the wrong places. But the father stood on the roof of the house because irrespective of who he had been with, he was still his son, the apple of his eye. And there was a problem when the father embraced. Well, let me go on. Let me go on. Point number two. The fatness of the anointing breaks the yokes of human limitations with an outpouring of the fatness of God. So what's anointing? What's anointing? Is it a feeling? Is it a, is it a way we say, oh, I, I see the anointing because there's a miracle. Uh, the anointing is far greater than that. He says so beautifully, on that day the yoke will be broken because of a fatness. A fatness of God that's coming upon his people. Look at those verses as we go on. The anointing is a dynamic, massive supply of the fatness of God that breaks our yokes of human limitations from the inside to the out. And that's why Apostle Paul could say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, just now. He knew what was inside him. He knew the indwelling Christ that was inside of him. He, you know, you could look at these verses from different places. He's talking to Saul. He says, the spirit of the Lord will rush upon you. First Samuel 10, verses 6 to 7. The spirit of the Lord. What's the anointing? The spirit of God will rush upon you. You will prophesy and be turned into another man. Tap someone and say, be turned into another man. Hallelujah. Be turned into another woman. Yeah, you can use the word woman too. Be turned into another woman. Be turned into a different youth. Be turned into a different young adult like Gideon. And a different youth like, like David. And a different child like Samuel. And a different newborn in your womb that you're carrying and saying, this one is like John the Baptist. Because there's an anointing coming upon our children, upon our youth, upon our young adults. And when they get older and older and older and 80 year olds like Hannah and Simeon come to the temple. The story even in their old ages that they came to the temple and were full of the anointing. They were full of the anointing. We can't outgrow the anointed. And he's telling, you will be turned into another man when it comes to you. And that moment, whatever your hand finds to do, do it. Why? Because God is with you. That's the anointing. That's the anointing. The fatness. The fatness. God is with you. Was God with him before he got anointed? God was. But there was something of a fatness that was coming. And the guy who chased donkeys and a guy who chased sheep and a guy who was locked away as a slave and uh, imprisoned as, as a, a rapist done certain stuff because God was with him. So whatever his hands touched. I don't know if you remember in school the story, the Midas touch. Whatever he touched, he asked for a boon, it touched the gold, but then when he touched the water and he drank it, he got choked and he died. That's not the anointing of the Bible. Won't kill you. But it sure will do Satan a lot of harm. He says, whatever you get in your hands, don't depend on something from the institution. 
begin to depend on what God has put inside you. Because what the institution did not give, when there was no institution for David, when there was no institution for, for, uh, for Joshua and for Joseph and for all these guys, the God himself gave it to them at that place of anointing. And he says, you will, the, the Holy Spirit will rest upon you. Numbers 14, 24, my curl, Caleb, servant Caleb, he has a different spirit. Are you seeing what the anointing does? People look at you and say, Naveen has a different spirit. Different spirit. Different spirit. It doesn't go crazy. It doesn't resign the job because you didn't get a promotion. It doesn't walk away. It doesn't squabble. It doesn't fight. It doesn't plan to pull somebody else down. You got a different spirit inside you. You show them that your life does not depend on money. It does not depend on salary hikes. It doesn't depend on favor of man. It depends on favor of God. And whatever man may do to you, they put you in any place. The fatness is with Joseph in the prison. The fatness is with Joseph in the pit. The fatness is with Joseph when he's accused of being a rapist. The fatness is still where Joseph is. And when Joseph puts his hands in Egypt, the fatness translates to things he had no idea about. The fatness. If you're looking at somebody else in your company and hoping God changed that guy, God's looking at you and saying, I want the company to be proud of you because I changed you. I changed you. I'm doing something through you. There was a different spirit over there. Again, I can look at Genesis 39 verses 1 to 5. It says, now Joseph was brought to Egypt. He's in Potiphar's house. When, and, and he comes to Potiphar's house. He's sold as a slave. Verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph and he became a successful man. Do not round off successful man, but round off and highlight the Lord was with Joseph. Joseph didn't care. You, you can look at that and say, oh, wow, 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 yeah. He's becoming successful now, part of his house. No. The Lord was with Joseph in the pit. The Lord was with Joseph when he was walking to Egypt as a slave in chains. The Lord was with Joseph when he was being auctioned. The Lord will continue to be when part of his home is removed and Joseph is in prison. God will be with Joseph. That, my beloved ones, is anointing. It's beyond human limitations this morning. It calls you, it beckons you, it cries to you to come out. And it says the Lord was with Joseph. Verse 3, his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he done to succeed in his hands. His master saw that the Lord was with him. Does your boss see? Do the neighbors see? Do the people see? Do the ones above you see? Your degrees your proficiency or do they say God because when God is with you it's not that Daniel was excellent there was a God with him and when he stood with the best in Babylon God worked for him say God will work for me God will work for me. And when God works for you, they're looking and saying, you're 10 times better than the best. You got to be, right? Because whatever you put your hand to, God's hand is also on it. Whatever you put your hand to this morning, whatever you put your hand to this morning, God is with you. And whatever he did succeeded was five. From the time he made him oversee in the house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. From the time they brought you to the company, from the time you came into that apartment, from the time you took that new job, from the time you took that promotion, from the time you went to that new place where they placed you, from the time you done it, everybody announced and recognized that everything changed. What was the key thing that they recognized changed was the fact that here's a person in the center and God is with that person. Hallelujah. Come on, give him a clap offering this morning. This is for you. This is for you. Receive it. 
receive it. They take him. They put Joseph in prison. Look at the next text that I have for you very quickly. They put Joseph in prison. And it says he was in charge of every prisoner over there. In verse 39, it says the master took him, put him in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him straight verse love, gave him favor. Whatever done there, he was the one who did it. And the keeper of the prison paid no attention to what was in Joseph's charge. Because the Lord was with him. Come on, you need to be trusted by your boss like that. Then you say, I don't need to watch Ashwin. I, I don't need to watch that person. Why you don't need to watch? God is with him. God is watching the, what I have to watch. And so he says, and Apostle Paul says, whatever you do, do it unto God. I don't need to watch. I was telling Franklin, I said, some people will sign witness and they'll not be witness of anything in your marriage hereafter. But God in Malachi says, I am the witness to your marriage and I will be witnessing it 24 by 7. 24 by 7. And, and David's working and it underlined the line again and God was with him. Don't underline the word success. Don't underline the word success because he's in the is in the jailhouse. And Job near the anointing. And they would say everything is gone. But Job under the anointing will say. He gives. He takes away. Blessed be the name of my God. Come on give him a clap offering this morning. Has something been taken? Blessed be the name of the Lord because anything can be taken but I will never leave you or forsake you even until the ends of the world because you are my anointed. Come on, say a hallelujah somewhere this morning as we go forth. And his next moment you find Joseph in Genesis 41, 38 to 46. He's in Pharaoh's house and Pharaoh calls him and Pharaoh say, can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God. He notices God. The fatness is the presence of God. Since God shown to you all these things, there's none so discerning and wise that you, you will be over my house. I have set you over the land of Egypt. They will bow the name in their knee to you. You will wear, thus he set him all over the land. And I am Pharaoh and without consent, no one shall lift up hand or foot in the land of Egypt. And Joseph was only 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh. And God was with with Joseph and even Pharaoh recognized that God was with Joseph. Don't be angry with the man of the world when he doesn't recognize your good stuff. He's a man of the world. When he doesn't recognize your hard work. He's a man of the world. He's a man of the world. When he doesn't recognize you for the hard work in the institution. He's a man of the world. But the man of the world like Pharaoh... And the man of the world that is sitting in the dungeons. And the man of the world like Potiphar who buys and sells slaves. Even those men can recognize people with whom God is dwelling. And when something goes wrong and you're saying he didn't recognize me. Look at yourself in the mirror and say I blame myself. I didn't walk in my anointing. Pharaoh has not seen God in me. In me. Because you bought the lie that you can be secular in office and godly in church. You bought the lie that you can park your anointing in the office six days a week. You bought the lie that you can, you can be in certain places where the anointing doesn't allow you to be. You bought the lie that you can call and then you're wondering why. And God looks at you and me. And he says, on that day when I'm coming back, I'm just looking. How are you the light? I called you. I said, you are the light that shines in a crooked and perverse generation. You are the light. You are the light. You had the spirit and you hid it. You had the spirit and you hid it. 
Oh, I loved it when I was in the factory. I loved it that I was the only Christian in the batch. I don't know. I, 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 I felt different. I didn't cry saying I'm a minority. I had the chance to be the only light in the batch. I don't know if you understand that. Come on, somebody say hallelujah. Somebody say thank you, Jesus. You're in a difficult spot. The devil forces our people. Forces them saying you're the only, even the other so-called Christians inside here have compromised with everything. So shh, keep quiet. And the Lord your God tells you, you can't be quiet. Just shine. They will persecute you, the Bible says. Because your desire is to walk in godliness. Father and parent will persecute child and child will persecute parent when they walk in their anointing. Very, very, I will go to some of those other things later on. I mean, Moses, to Moses, Exodus 7 verse 1, he says, I made you like a God before Pharaoh. That's anointing. I made you like a God. He doesn't say, I didn't made you God. I made you like God to, to Pharaoh. Again, in Daniel chapter 4 verses 8 to 9, he's looking and he says, Daniel, the, the, the pagan kings are calling these slaves. And he says, bring his name is Balthazar after the name of my God. And in whom is the spirit of the holy gods? O Balthazar, chief of magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you. No one has given me the inter interpretation. I am calling you just now. Daniel chapter 4 verse 18, he's looking. He said, this dream, I can you Nebuchadnezzar saw and you Belshazzar tell me the inter interpretation because all my wise men in the kingdom were not able to make it known to me the interpretation but you are able for the spirit of the holy gods is in you are you catching it just now yeah, are you catching it just now there is a again in, uh, in, in Daniel 5 verse 13 onwards there is a man in your kingdom in whom the spirit of the holy gods dwell look at what he's saying over there Again in verse 13, you Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, you're an exile, I can remember your background. I have heard that you, of you that the spirit of the gods are in you. And then again in Daniel chapter 6 verse 3, then Daniel became distinguished above all or that or the presidents and the stars because an excellent spirit was in him and the king set him over the whole palace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you catching what anointing is? The fatness of God. Takes slavery, takes prison hold, just permeates you and breaks the slave name off. He says, you came as a slave here. Joseph, Joseph you came here as a slave. Today I want to make you chief minister. Daniel, you came as a slave. I won't make you rule over the land. You'll be right under me. Because they broke off human limitations by the anointing that was resting upon their lives. God was with them. The same thing happened with Jesus in Acts chapter 10, 37 to 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. And God was with him. So he was healing and he was and, and, and delivering the oppressed by the devil. And the, the same thing is said of the anointing on the disciples and the deacons later on in Acts chapter 6. They were full of the Holy Spirit. They were so full of God. It's a fatness from God. It is of God and it is God. God anointed, the Holy Spirit came, it was of God, and God was with him. It is God, the anointing is God, 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 God all around. Catch it this moment as we are coming to an end just now. Catch it this moment. And he says in 1 John chapter 2 verse 20, You are anointed by the Holy One. And he therefore understand who you are. In 1 Corinthians 1, 19 to 20, God who established us with you in Christ and has anointed us, also put a seal, has given us the Holy Spirit. And you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You see the anointing with spirit, with power, and the presence of God that He will never leave us. 2 Corinthians 1, 19 to 22. And it is God who has establishes you in Christ and anointed us. Again in 1 John 2, 27, the anointing that you received abides, remains in you. Can you say that this morning? The anointing abides. 
the anointing remains. Saul chose not to stay in the abiding anointing. You look in that, at, at, at Samson, he didn't choose to stay. But he says in the end of that verse, he says, just as you were taught, as he, the anointing abides in you, you abide in him. You see that? That's the difference. That's the difference. Anointing coming is God's business. Staying in the, under the anointing is our business. Staying under the anointing is under business, our business. And he says, uh, it, it, it's a fatness of, it's not a fatness of signs and wonders and prosperity. It's the fatness of God in your life. His Holy Spirit, His power of a living God displaying glory. The proof of the abiding under the anointing is simply that. And so he says in John 15 verses 4 under, uh, onwards, he says, you, you, I abide in me and I in you unless you abide in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit for apart from me you can do nothing. Therefore, whatever you put your hand to, God takes it over. But apart from God and the presence and the anointing, you and I can do nothing. Can do nothing. Can do nothing. And he says, if you abide in me, ask whatever you wish, it will be done for you. By this the Father is glorified. And he saw as Daniel was transitioning. Today that word transition is crazy. We want to know how to transition from male to female and female to male. And God says transform, transition from being an ordinary human person controlled by human limitations and the chains and the powers of sin and learn to be a son and daughter of the Most High God. That is transition. That is transition. And if somebody has a problem with their gender, they go before God and say, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit because I want a pathway of transition from the limitations and the negativity of the world to be able to stand in your house and in your coats and not have to alter every, anything else because the Holy Spirit has filled me, transformed me, and I stand in your presence equal and more than everybody else because God is at work in me both to will and to do his good pleasure. You see, beloved, we are all beholding God's glory. It is not that Samson broke ropes, it's the Spirit of God came upon him. He refused to stay under it. Saul was still king, but he did not know when the Spirit left him and an evil spirit came. So also with anointing. And as I close just now, it's not your job, it's not your family, it's not your gender, it's not your education, it's not your specialization. It's not your physical appearance, it's not your emotional, it's not the events of your life. It's not whether you're divorced, you're single, you're orphan, you're diabetic, you have chronic illness, you have, you have assets or don't have assets. It's not whether you have possessions or your possessions possess you or whatever it is. It's not those things that make you you. We're running after the wrong things. We're running after the wrong things. And then we derive identities. I'm a millionaire. Ha, what millionaire? You can't take one pice out when it's all done. You can be whatever millionaire you want. But if now you're being changed to be more and more and more like Jesus, that you will take out. You can't take your prayers or you can't take your speaking in tongues, that thing should have made you more like Jesus. You can't go to God and tell Him how many hours you read the Bible. It's how much the Bible reading made Jesus in you. And I urge you just now, you're reading the story that, yes, it says those men were all successful. Today we're running after things the way we should be running after the anointing. We're running after things the way we should be running after the anointing. I want to close with this. Jim Carrey said this. Can you put that slide up? You remember the actor Jim Carrey? He says, I think everybody should get rich and famous and everything that they ever dreamed of 
so that they can see it is not the answer. Millionaire. Net worth 185 million. 29 movies. 13 of them were box office hits that, that cleared 250 million F in the first week. His house is almost 13 million. And, he's, and Jim Carrey says, here's the other thing he says, we need deep rest from the character we are trying to play. I need deep rest. What do you want to be? What have you decided to be? Everything else, the anointing will make you to be. But if you remove everything else from your list and say, I decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. Thank you.